people ask me what I do for a living, I have a really difficult time putting my job title into words. Podcast host just doesn't quite cover it. And entrepreneur, maybe a little vague. But what about astonishment facilitator? Because essentially that's what my job is. I'm a facilitator of astonishment. It doesn't say that in the fine print in any government paperwork. <laughs> that's what I do. I facilitate astonishment. People come in, their, their mouths are agape. They're looking at these sheer cliffs and the highest waterfalls in North America. And if they're not astonished, that means they're in some sort of coma and they need some medical inducement to get them out of that coma. But, I mean, when people are here, you just see this look of... Looks like astonishment facilitator has already been taken. But at least he joins us on Mountain Meister. Hello, everyone. Before we get to the show, you should know that I'll be doing a Summit for Someone climb of Mount Langley and recording a series of podcast episodes there. It's going to be a great time. And there are a few spots left on the trip, at least last I heard there were. If you're interested in joining us, you can go to our website, mtnmeister.com. We have the link to the climb right on the homepage. Or just shoot me an email, ben at mtnmeister.com, and I will tell you everything you need to know, or at least connect you to somebody who does. All right, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome, welcome to Mountain Meister. Today with us, we welcome Shelton Johnson. He's a ranger with the National Park Service and has worked for national parks for 28 years. After growing up in inner city Detroit, he found his way to Yellowstone and now Yosemite, where he's been for the past 22 years. He's the author of Glory Land and has shaken hands with both Oprah Winfrey and President Barack Obama. Sheldon Johnson, welcome to Mountain Meister. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. It's a pleasure being here. Shaking hands with the president is kind of a, a secret lifetime goal of mine. Uh, how was it? Wow! Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. Um, it was pretty amazing. Not just so much the, the even the handshake, but just the actual occasion, being in the White House and having the experience of seeing President Obama watch me in a film, uh, and then meeting him after you know the screening of sections of that film. It was something that I couldn't have even dreamed of happening years earlier. So it was a pretty powerful experience. Very neat. Tell our listeners a little bit about the film. Well, it was the Ken Burns, Dayton Duncan's PBS documentary film in the national parks called The National Parks America's mm -hmm. Best Idea. And there was a special screening of segments of the film for President Barack Obama at the White House. We'll have a link to that on your Meister profile page, Shelton. Now, how about the handshake itself? Was it a, was it a good handshake? It was, uh, I have to say, it was one of the best handshakes or the best handshake really? I've ever And it's not just so much because that it was the President of the United States. Certainly, that made it much more memorable. What, what made it a, a really profound experience was just the fact that it was Barack Obama, the first African-American president of the United States. And when he took my hand, he never really let go. And that's what I remember from it. And the last time I'd had an experience similar to that was when I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa. You know, it, uh, it's a different sort of thing when you're in a, another culture. And I remember one of the teachers that I was working with shaking my hand. And while we were talking, he never let go of my hand. And in the United States, if, you know, if a guy takes your hand, he never lets go of your hand. It can mean a certain thing or maybe not so certain. But, uh, but I understood that when I was in Liberia, it was a completely different cultural context. Mm -hmm. And he was just basically saying, you're my friend. And he just kept holding in my hand. So when President Obama did it here, you know, in the United States, it was uh, unusual, but it also felt, I, I felt like that that he really wanted me to feel welcome in the White House. He really wanted me to to feel that that we were on the same plane to some degree. And he, he has this great ability to make you feel that you're special, that you're important. And considering that he is the president of the United States, that's a very powerful gift to have, that sense of humility and kindness and generosity. So it was it was very a very potent combination. Wow, that sounds like a, a great handshake. Um, and you're so you're so poetic when you talk, Shelton. And I, I saw that you studied uh, poetry in grad school. That's right. Yeah, I was in a, in the Master of Fine Arts program in poetry or in creative writing at the University of Michigan. So, as far as your job is concerned, I, I actually 
didn't really know what a ranger exactly did at the National Park Service. Obviously, uh, there's some law enforcement there, but what what is your job? Well, I'm the go-between. I'm the intermediary. I'm that which stands between the resource, meaning the giant sequoia, the, the, the sheer granite cliffs of Yosemite Valley, Half Dome, El Capitan. And I'm the person who stands between the, that particular aspect of Yosemite and the general public. So you could you basically think of a, a ranger wearing that green, that green uniform and, and that uh, felt hat and just think of that person being an ambassador who literally is there to create a bridge between the public and, and astonishment, because essentially that's what my job is. I'm a facilitator of astonishment. It doesn't say that in the fine print <laughs> in any government paperwork. Basically, that's what I do. I facilitate astonishment. People come in, their mouths are agape. They're looking at these sheer cliffs and the highest waterfalls in North America. And if they're not astonished, that means they're in some sort of coma and they need some medical inducement to get them out of that coma. But, I mean, when people are here, you just see this look of, of the starry-eyed uh, wonder that's in their faces. And it doesn't matter if they're from China, if they're from Mongolia, if they're from Angola, uh, or they're from Kansas. Everybody has that same sort of look. And so there's everyone's bound by that common humanity in the sense of, being seeing something and being in the presence of something that literally is profound. And you can just see that as a daily occurrence in Yosemite Valley. That is too good. Astonishment facilitator. Oh man, yeah. you have the dream job. Um, has the position changed over time? I mean, we're talking, I think the hundred year anniversary is coming up of the national park system. Has the ranger role changed over time? Well, yeah, it has. It has. Of course, it began with the United States Army. The, the U.S. Army would comprise the first protectors of the national parks in Yellowstone beginning in 1886, and then Yosemite and Sequoia in 1891, and that's where we get the ranger hat. The ranger hat de- derives literally from the campaign hat worn by the U.S. cavalry and also the infantry that served here as well. So since then, uh, you know, in the old days, back in the 20s and 30s, you know, the Park Service was established in 1916, but in the early days, you know, rangers did everything. You know, you remember that phrase, jack of all trades, mm-hmm. master of none. Uh, but since then, you know, getting into the 40s and 50s, it, be- it has become much more specialized. So now if you see a ranger with a flat hat, that ranger could be an administrator. He or she could be a chief of this or a chief of that, chief, you know, a superintendent. Or that person could be law enforcement. And if they're law enforcement, they could also engage with uh, search and rescue. They can do, uh, you know, uh, rescues off of cliffs here in Yosemite Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, so the swift water rescue, all sorts of different things that they're able to do and tackle besides just the usual thing of pulling over a car that's speeding and giving you a ticket or giving you a warning about the dangers of speeding in a national park. And rangers also can be scientists and wear the exact same uniform, but they could be out in the field and they could be tracking bears or mountain lions or learning about uh, a giant sequoia. Um, so there's, there's a whole variety of different things that rangers are engaged in in the national parks. And what do you consider your specialty? Well, I'm a teacher. That's essentially what an interpretive ranger is. I mean, again, I'm I'm that uh, philosophical go-between, you know, the the, the landscape that has brought people here for over 150 years. And I'm there to basically give them more information and uh, and add. I'm fueling the fires of astonishment. I mean, really, I'm I'm throwing fuel on that fire because I want people to be ablaze with that sense of wonder because then they'll remember it. And if they remember it, they'll do something to protect it in the future. And that's all that we're really focused on. It's not just the present, but we're a future-inflected agency, and it's a future-inflected mission. So it's not just today's astonishment. We're, we're so- sowing the seeds of tomorrow's wonder as well. So poetic. Before we get into Yosemite specifically, I wanted to talk a little bit about just the U.S. national park system uh, in general. 59 national parks. How many of those have you been to? You know, I've never really counted, hmm. um, but basically many of the parks in the West, some of the parks that back east, I mean, the ones that, st- that stick in my mind, I've been to the Everglades, I've been to Great Smoky Mountains, hmm. I've been to uh, and worked in Yellowstone and Grand Teton, I've worked in Great Basin, I visited Redwood National Park, uh, North Cascades, Olympic, Mount Rainier, Denali, Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas. Uh, and then, of course, Arches, Zion, been to those parks as well. Uh, I've never met a park I, I, I didn't like. <laughs> oh, Black Canyon of the Gun, I've been there as well. And it's not just me going there. It really, it's those places becoming part of me, becoming mm-hmm. part of my 
cellular structure. I mean, once you're in a park and you're breathing, and obviously most of us tend to be breathing, you know, you, you take it in. It's not just the atmosphere you take in. It's just that whole sensibility of what makes that place unique in the world. Right. And that becomes part of who you are. For the listeners, just a, a few more facts on uh, national parks. I, I took the total acreage of the National Parks Service, and it looks to be about the size of Germany. So that's how much uh, mm-hmm. protected land we have in this country, which is pretty impressive. Do any other countries that you know of, Shelton, have this kind of uh, system in place, like to the extent that the U.S. does, or is this something that really makes us special? Well, we're, we are special because we the national park idea, the cradle of the national park idea is right here in Yosemite Valley with the passage of the Yosemite Grant on June 30th, 1864, that became the legal precedent for the Yellowstone Act in 1872, which set aside Yellowstone National Park. And Yellowstone's creation sparked a global national park movement. And now there are over 150 nations around the world that have either national parks and or some sort of national park system. So there are, so example, I was part of the second park service delegation to China. China has some, there's a few national parks in China that are older by hundreds and hundreds of years uh, than yellow, old, much older than Yellowstone or, or the or Yosemite. It's just that those particular areas did not spark a global national park movement, and the creation of Yellowstone did did do that. And so that's why Yellowstone's considered the world's first national park. It sparked not just uh, the the it, it sparked a new way of looking at the world, a new way of being in the world, a new way of perceiving nature from perceiving it in a very negative, uh, confrontational way to one that's much more embracing and one that's much more organic. I've seen some videos of you talking about Yosemite and yeah, the passions there. What do you find that makes Yosemite so unique? Now, you notice I began that with silence. That's what makes Yosemite <laughs> unique. When you, you, when you're standing at Glacier Point and you're looking down into this glacially carved abyss, which is a better way to describe it than a canyon, it's, it's the space itself that that, that astonishes. The, the first thing that you're thinking is that there is no thought. There's no thought. There are no words. People aren't talking. Everyone basically is very quiet, and they tend to be silent. It's the same sort of silence you can find in a mosque, in a temple, in a cathedral. You have this sense of the sacred. You have this sense of the universe around you. You have this, this sense of light and space, and you're, and you're just a small part. You're just a particle that's floating around right there, no longer attached to the earth, but literally separated from the earth because you've become part of everything that you're seeing. You be, you've become part of the view that you're taking in, that you're, that you're sharing with yourself. And so it's a, it's, it's a sort of experience that the best way to describe it, it, it is cosmic. It is transcendent. And I think that there are very few opportunities in the world where you can, where you can be pulled outside of yourself into something much greater. And one of those places that's a human construct would be inside a cathedral or a church or something like that, a mosque. But the larger construct is, is the earth itself. And so when you're at Glacier Point, you're not thinking that this is Yosemite National Park. You're thinking, what an amazing world that we live in. And it's right there stretching out beneath my feet for thousands of feet. And you feel like this is the first day of the, of the creation of the world. And that's not anything you can really disparage to feel like you're at the beginning of the world. And, and that morning is this morning. I've never been to Yosemite. Sounds like I need to go. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend it. But I'd come in the spring and, and or in the fall, early winter. It's much quieter. You know, it's the third most popular national park in the country. So there are a lot of people, 4.1 million visitors a year. Wow. With the first being? Great Smoky Mountains. Most Americans live in the eastern seaboard. So that's, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful park, mm-hmm. but that's where most, most people live. So that's the most popular. Then, then Grand Canyon is number two, and then Yosemite is number three. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. There are a lot of climbers in Yosemite, uh, hunters in some national parks, fishing in others. How do you decide what can and can't be done? What's the decision process? Well, I mean, it's, in, it's what's listed in our, our CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, there's certain activities that aren't allowed. Like, for example, people cannot fly drones. Hmm. Drones are not permitted in Yosemite National Park. But people can climb. Not only can people climb, there's not even specifically a permit process for climbing. People, climbers just drive along the road and see whatever area they want to climb, and they can just start climbing. But if you're in the backcountry in wilderness – you need a wilderness permit. If you're climbing half dome, you need a half dome permit. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to me how certain aspects or certain 
um, activities are, are really highly regulated and other activities to some degree, it's like the old West again. But you want to keep in mind that even those activities that are not regulated, that doesn't mean they're not being monitored. So we have, we, you know, we have some rangers are climbers and some of those climbing ranges are out there in the meadows and they're watching what's going on and seeing what's happening and people being safe and, and if they're following good etiquette in terms of what they do with their gear and what they, you know, if they don't abandon it on the cliff face, but take it with them if, if they can. You know, so um, Yosemite is many things to many different people and that's what makes it really unique compared to other national parks. It, most of the Yosemite, about 94% is wilderness, but at the same time, uh, over 90% of the people who come to Yosemite, they just come to Yosemite Valley, which is only 3% of the park. So the most congested, the most coveted part of the park gets most of the tension, which means that the back country, relatively speaking, is pretty quiet. And now and it's, that's not, say, I'm not saying that it's quiet by the standards of other parks that are quieter in visitation. I'm saying it's quiet for Yosemite. You know, and there's a difference because, again, we, we receive 4.1 million visitors a year and 90 percent of the 4.1 million are going into a seven square mile valley where the park is over 1,200 square miles. And that is why the rest of the park relatively is relatively quiet compared to Yosemite Valley. Mm-hmm. Sheldon, you've been a longtime advocate for getting more minorities into our national park system, uh, specifically African-Americans. It doesn't really take long to realize that there aren't many minorities in in the park system. Just kind of take a look around. Let's start with why. Why in a country like America that's so diverse, uh, why aren't we seeing more minorities in the national park system? Well, you know, when you when you talk to people who who visit national parks all the time, and you and you bring up their childhood and what happened during that period. So often folks will say, when I was a little boy, when I was a little girl, my, my mom and dad, they, they took us to Glacier National Park or they took us to Yellowstone National Park. And so part of their childhood was spent in America's wonderlands, and they've never, they never forgot that experience. And to such a degree that when they became adults and they started their own families, they would continue that tradition with their own children. And that's how the national park experience can be passed on from generation to generation. Well, if you come from a community uh, or from a family that has, does not have a historic connection to any national park, then, then you don't feel that same sense of cultural connection or family connection or, 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 or a community connection. And, no, and if no one that you know in your community visits national parks, no one in your extended family visits national parks, no one at your school does, does that or engages in that sort of activity, no one at your church does that, that is something completely off the radar, the cultural ra- radar of what you uh, do, what your family may do in terms of recreation. So to break that cycle, you literally have to have somebody who just comes into that circle and just says, hey, let's go to Zion or let's go to Yellowstone. And if that doesn't happen, it's something that other people do, not something that you do in your own family. And that's the problem for African-Americans. For many African-Americans, there's no history of connection, of cultural connection and use of the national parks because we come from a history of segregation. We come from a history of separate and unequal. And so there were many places historically where African-Americans not only could not go, we could actually be brutalized or killed if we tried to go and try to go somewhere where we, where we were not allowed. And even though those laws have been overturned and there's been the civil rights movement in between that period of, of, of separation and now we have a period of integration, the, the, the difficulty is, is that there are still lingering psychological, spiritual barriers that are out there that, that for many African Americans, they don't even necessarily form the thought of, wow, the Grand Canyon is for me. And if you don't have that thought that the Grand Canyon is for you as, as much as it is for anyone else, that Yellowstone National Park belongs to you as, as much as it does to any American, then why would you make the leap of let's go to Yellowstone? The other thing to keep in mind is, is for many Americans who are not African-American, who are not uh, part of a community of color, there's a sense of, that, or maybe this sense of, of ownership that's already implicit. You don't even have to talk about it. So you don't have necessarily a sense of danger or anxiety when you hop in your car and you travel cross country. Mm-hmm. Well, for many African Americans, there's a history of, well, if you hop in your car, you got to make certain that where you're going, the route that you're going is safe. And so the, the whole idea of the journey, uh, the road trip that so many Americans engage in has a completely different character to it. Mm-hmm. If you're a person of color, especially 
if you're African American. Because there was a time when in this country there were towns that if you were found in those towns after sundown, they were called sundown towns, you could be brutalized, you could be physically assaulted. And that's not the case so much anymore, but memories die hard. And so I, I, so what I'm saying is what I think keeps many African Americans out of the national parks is this legacy of, of, of basically not being accepted and, and not being uh, invited to these places. And if a place is not, if you don't receive an invitation, uh, it takes a little bit of will to just basically crash the party. <laughs> so, so were you were you born under this? I mean, you grew up in inner city Detroit. How are you introduced to this? I was in the exact. Ex- the, I was in the exact situation. No one in my high school. No one in my junior high school. No family that I ever met growing up in inner city Detroit ever visited a national park. No one. No one that I talked to ever even talked about national parks. It never came up in a conversation. It never came up in a conversation, even in school. I don't even remember hearing about national parks when I was in the public schools in Detroit. They didn't exist. So how did you find it? Well, because I'm a military kid. So even though I grew up in Detroit, I grew up in a lot of other places as well. So I lived in Germany. I went to kindergarten in Germany. I went to the first and second grade in London, England, and we lived in Germany. My dad was stationed at Rammstein Air Force Base. We had a family trip to Berchtesgaden, which is in the Bavarian Alps. And I never forgot that memory of being in the Alps, being in the mountains and seeing clouds beneath my feet and seeing snow and feeling the cold, the coldness of the air as it was blowing through me and seeing the light because, you know, you're so much closer to the sky. The sky is not just above you when you're in the mountains. The sky is below you. It's to every side. And there was this sense of that uh, I was part of the sky. It felt like I was in the realm of the gods. It was just an absolutely profound experience to be five years old and to be in a mountaintop in, 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 in the Bavarian Alps. Well, I never forgot that experience. And so when I was growing up in Detroit, I had all these memories of being in the mountains. And every time I I was watching television and I saw anything having to do with mountains, I felt I gravitated to that imagery. And I felt that that place was some place that either I had been or will return to. I mean, that's that's the kind of connection that I had. And it was a connection was forged by my parents just by having me and my brother right there in uh, southern Germany and taking us to Bavaria. If that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's interesting that what ha- what inspired you to be such an integral part of the national park system didn't take place in America. <laughs> no, no. My first experience of mountains was right. in Germany. I guess what needs to happen? What are you doing and what could our listeners do to make this progression happen more effectively and faster? The first thing is just to keep having conversations like this. You know, I mean, you know, encourage if you have friends, if you have family, um, acquaintances that are African-American and you're, if people are talking about what they're going to do that weekend and you know, to ask them, if you, have you ever been to a national park? Do you have an interest in going into a national park? And many African-Americans just have really not much information about the national parks, because keep in mind that tourism in general and the tourism industry in particular has not necessarily directed its messages at African-Americans, at Hispanics, at Asian-Americans. It's basically been the larger culture. But we're approaching a time where the dominant culture is increasingly becoming people of color here in the United States. And so that is starting to change. But there's no history of connection. There's no history of that stewardship and that, or that sense that this place, these places belong to you. So the result is, is that unless somebody extends their hand and says, hey, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Olympic National Park and say you live in Seattle and you're talking to an African-American family, but we're going out there this weekend. You want to come with us? And just to, just to make that introduction, because the irony is, is that all of these places belong to African-Americans and Hispanics and, and Asian-Americans as much as anyone else. But unless someone actually states that and those people feel that, then there's no connection at all. And if there's no such connection, then as the, the, the demographics continue to shift in the United States, that puts at peril the sustainability of the national park idea itself. Because parks exist at the pleasure of the, the American people. And the majority of the American people are saying, well, we don't go to parks. We don't visit them. Why should we pay taxes for them? Well, that puts into jeopardy the national parks themselves. Right. So how do you feel about role models? I mean, if it's not, if the influence is not coming from the family, uh, sometimes influences can come from role models outside of the family. 
We've had 125 people on this show, all of whom are seen as role models, but you are the first African-American person we've had on this show. Now, that's not obviously due to any prejudice on my part. Uh, It just seems like there aren't that many minorities in this industry. Where are the role models? Yeah, the thing is, so the, the role models are there. It's just it's just creating the bridges hmm. between the role models and and their respective communities. And for and and that's not the easiest thing to do. I mean, for example, you know, I, I probably have had more exposure with the media with my attempts to get the Buffalo Soldier history, mm-hmm. that stewardship story, the Simone and Sequoia, out into the world. I mean, I was a guest on the Oprah Winfrey Show. I, you know, I was a, a talking head in the National Parks America's Best Idea. I've had interviews with ABC World News, the CBS Sunday Morning Show, Sunset Magazine, the New York Times, USA Today. And so I'm out there. But but the result is is that that's, it's, it's few and far between. There, there, there need to be more images and more interviews of people of color who do this line of work so that their communities hear about them and see them and are aware of them. There are millions of African Americans who've never heard of Shelton Johnson even though there's millions of Americans who've seen the Ken Burns film or the Oprah Winfrey show, and they do know about me. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the problem, the, the, the disconnect between what people are doing, what people of color are doing to protect, you know, these areas, whether they're national parks or national forests, and, and then the people who live in these communities who have no connection to those, those spaces, those places. Mm-hmm. For the listeners, you heard Shelton mention the Buffalo Soldier and the story there. We'll have some relevant links on his Meister profile page if you want to learn more there. Uh, Sheldon, before the interview, I asked you if you would be able to give our listeners a gear recommendation, and you had an answer that I wasn't expecting. Tell our listeners why you can't give a gear recommendation. Well, because I'm a federal employee. And so basically, I wear a uniform, and as I'm talking to you right now, I'm on official government time, and I wear a badge. And so for me to make a recommendation, it becomes a recommendation from the National Park Service itself, which I'm prohibited from actually doing. You know, so I, I can't really make – I don't feel comfortable making a recommendation, but let's just put it this way. Um, I like good gear <laughs> when, I'm hiking, when I'm hiking. And uh, I can say that certain places I like, I, you know, I lived in Seattle and there's a particular company that started in Seattle and uh, they have a lot of great gear. And I think everybody knows who I'm talking about. And I go to that place that has that great gear that began in Seattle. Um, I go there quite often to, you know, for tents and uh, sleeping bags and hiking shoes and you name it. So I think that's a roundabout way of, of telling you exactly where I tend to shop for my outdoor gear <laughs> without without getting into naming who that particular company might might actually be. Absolutely. For the listeners, go to Seattle. Check it out. You might find some good gear there. <laughs> yeah, and of course, they're not just in Seattle. They're even right. in Fresno now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, finally, Sheldon, before we let you go, we like to hear who you'd like to hear as the next Meister on Mountain Meister. Um, boy, I gotta, I have to, who would I, who I would like to hear? I mean, anyone? I mean, absolutely anyone? Ideally, some sort of outdoors enthusiast, professional, uh, and alive. We had somebody recommend Lewis and Clark one time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I actually would like to have you interview John Francis. And tell our listeners about John. John Francis is a, a United Nations Goodwill Ambassador. He basically has a he, he basically is famous for being known as the Planet Walker. He he witnessed the the Exxon Valdez oil disaster, stopped talking for like over twenty years, and in, in that period of silence, he finished his PhD. And uh, basically, he walks around the world uh, talking about uh, raising people's environmental awareness. And he's supposed to be getting a film, a biopic, uh, made made about his life. But he would be a good person to talk to because there aren't very many African Americans that are uh, United Nations goodwill ambassadors and who are uh, have you know, achieved the things that he's achieved. Absolutely, for the listeners, keep an ear out for that on a future episode of Mountain Meister. Sheldon, it has been wonderful talking to you today. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. For the listeners, you can see highlights of today's episode on our website, mtnmeister.com. Everything that we talked about, all the links, uh, Shelton's gear recommendation, his very specific gear recommendation will be on his page as well. (laughs) Thanks, Shelton. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Ben. (laughs) 
Shelton Johnson Astonishment Facilitator. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget that we're supported by the DeLorme InReach Explorer. You can get $35 off of your purchase at inreachdelorme.com by using the code MEISTER at checkout. Send and receive text messages, create waypoints, and find your way back from anywhere with the DeLorme InReach Explorer. Today's guest was a recommendation from one of our Meister fans. Jordan, thanks for that recommendation. For you other Meister fans out there, if you'd like to hear somebody on the show, let us know. Per usual, enjoy doing the rest of whatever you do while you listen. I'm Ben Shank, and you've been listening to Mountain Meister. Mountain Meister.